The Carnegie Mellon Quarantine Database Talks are made possible by the Stephen Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real and by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. So uh, we're happy today to have Avi Kitty, uh, the CTO and co-founder of Celia DB. Um, prior to starting Celia, he worked on the, the KVM at, at Red Hat uh, for a while, and then they started uh, Celia DB in, I think, in 2013, is that correct, or 2012? Yeah, around 2013. Okay. Uh, and so we appreciate him for being uh, up with us. He's currently in, in Israel, so it's late night for him. So we appreciate him uh, spending time with us. Again, we're sponsored by the Stephen Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real, and we thank them for their support for these quarantine database talks. And we'll do the same thing we do every every week. Uh, we want this to be interactive as possible. So if you have a question for Avi, just unmute yourself, say who you are and where you're coming from, and then ask your question. Okay, Avi, the floor is yours. Thank you for doing this. Okay, uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, it's indeed almost midnight here, so do not be alarmed if I turn into a pumpkin at the top of the hour. It's uh, completely normal. Uh, so I'll talk about the uh, SillaDB, uh, uh, no compromised performance. Uh, this will be a rather uh, low level talk compared to the uh, other talks that I've seen. I've, I've sampled a few talks. Uh, so this will be rather low level. I hope you'll, uh, you'll, you'll enjoy it. So let's start. What, what is uh, SillaDB? There are about 8 million uh, databases around. So let's try to map it. Uh, among all of the other uh, options. So it's a distributed NoSQL database. Um, the main use case is the online transaction processing. So it, it does uh, support analytics, really via things like uh, Spark or Presto, but the main use cases are uh, online uh, transaction processing. Uh, it's compatible with several other databases. Uh, so first is the Apache Cassandra. Uh, which was the inspiration, and this is more or less the model that uh, we followed uh, with um, the Cassandra query language uh, and language and protocol, and also the Thrift protocol, which is uh, the other protocol that is used by Cassandra. Uh, it's also uh, compatible with DynamoDB, so we implement the same API, which is uh, JSON over uh, HTTP. And uh, Cassandra and DynamoDB are also uh, related in a way because both are based on uh, an older database called the Dynamo, also by uh, Amazon. And it also has uh, support for some of the verbs um, supported by Redis. So only a small number because this is it's in infancy. But it does show that uh, uh, we support multiple models and uh, we, we plan to increase our compatibility uh, along the way and add more interesting uh, protocols. Uh, we have uh, very good performance, so uh, about uh, uh, up to 10 times uh, on the same hardware with the same characteristics. Uh, what most user, uh, users opt to is to have not uh, exercise the full 10x, but instead spend some of the headroom on reducing latency. Um, so typically you achieve about uh, uh, 5x performance, but with better uh, latency. Um, you get a very good latency, and uh, most of this talk will uh, focus on, on the performance and latency. And it's implemented in uh, C++, uh, and it's open source. Uh, you can find it on GitHub. Quickly, so I, I, I don't want to focus too much on this, but like it's C++20, like, that obviously didn't exist when you started it in 2012. So like, how do you decide, like, going, you know, did you start at 11 and then go, to, then go to 14, 17, 20? Like, are you guys rolling this forward? Like, how, yeah, how so, you... yeah, so the company was founded in around 2013, but the database was actually started a bit later. So we started with C++14 and then uh, updated to C++17 and C++20 uh, when they were re released. Uh, we are really excited about C++20 because it brings us uh, support for coroutines which are really helpful for um, the, the models that uh, we're implementing. Um, I don't think we'll be able to touch into that, but uh, it is uh, very interesting. We are very interested in coroutines as well. Uh, keep, okay. keep going, keep going. Yeah. All right. Uh, so you support uh, multiple consistency models. Um, the first is uh, eventual uh, using um, uh, concurrent replicated uh, data types. Uh, that's an acronym that I guess 
many people just remember the acronym and not not the actual words behind it. Um, and eventual consistency gives you uh, very good performance, especially with multiple uh, data centers. But it's not suitable for uh, all kinds of uh, for every kind of uh, use case. Uh, some use cases like uh, uh, Internet of Things. Um, uh, can uh, use uh, eventual consistency, but other use cases uh, need uh, stronger consistency. So for that, we have um, uh, lightweight transactions based on uh, Paxos, and we're also working on uh, Raft support in order to uh, improve the performance of our um, uh, lightweight transactions. And you can also have a mixed con uh, consistency model where within a data center you have um, uh, strong consistency, but uh, the replication for other data centers is asynchronous. So you get kind of a mix between the two models. Uh, it's aimed at uh, um, multi terabyte or, or even petabyte workloads. So it's a uh, big data uh, and also high performance. So uh, even the smallest deployments uh, have tens of thousands of ops per second and the largest grow to millions of uh, ops per second. And uh, we have demos of uh, uh, simple workloads that do a million ops per second uh, per node. Uh, so uh, more complex workloads usually have uh, uh, lower performance, but it does show that uh, you can, the raw throughput is very high. How big is a typical node, Avi? Uh, so a, a very typical node is um, and the Amazon i3 or i3n, and those have uh, the i3 uh, dot metal has a uh, half a terabyte of ram um 36 cores or 72 vcpus uh and uh, 16 terabytes of disk and uh, that is actually uh, part of this slide we also aim for having a high uh, disk to ram ratio so a lot of uh, um, modern databases or most of the open source databases uh, really rely on uh, uh, on high caching, so uh, you need most of the data to be um, uh, in memory, cached in memory. Otherwise, the performance starts to tank, uh, and this doesn't work well when you have a, a high amount of data. Because if you look at the price of RAM, uh, uh, you want to keep a high ratio of um, uh, disk to RAM because RAM prices are very high. So if you have something like 100 terabytes uh, that, uh, that uh, computes to a million dollars just for the RAM in, in the cluster. Uh, so keeping a high disk to RAM ratio uh, keeps the cost low. Uh, and uh, we're also uh, self-tuning, and we'll have uh, an example of that later on. And the problem is with those databases is that they're complex, and also the workloads uh, are not constant. They, they change with time. Uh, and you, uh, even if you manage to tune your system to a workload, uh, over time it changes and you have to keep retuning it. And of course, everything is in production. Uh, so this is quite an effort. Okay, so we have a symmetric architecture and this is uh, more or less the same as the Cassandra. Uh, so in this example, we have three nodes and uh, each node is divided into two layers, the coordination layer and the storage layer or the replica layer, uh, and there is a full um, connection mesh. Uh, the fact that uh, we don't have errors connecting every client to every coordinator and every coordinator to every uh, storage layer is just because I was uh, lazy. Um, so uh, the, the, the two layers are in the same process. So when we have a coordinator talking to its own storage, uh, it doesn't use RPC or TCP. Uh, it just uh, uses a local procedure call. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we exploit this uh, symmetry even more by using a thread pair core architecture. So in fact, each node is internally divided uh, into identical uh, uh, shards, each of which contains its own coordination and, and storage layer, which act more or less independently uh, but they do share all of the resources in the node, which is the memory and the CPU uh, and, and the disk. Uh, so uh, we need to, uh, both, both, we both try to share the resources in order to maximize the utilization, but also we have to isolate them so that uh, 
one of them does not dominate over the other, and we have some mechanisms for that. So we use the uh, log structured uh, merge tree. Um, I assume that uh, you've studied this and you know what it is. I'll just give a, a small overview of it. So uh, instead of having a, a data structure that is always sorted on disk like a B tree, uh, we, we keep the data as it is written in memory and we keep it sorted in memory using a, a balanced tree structure. Um, but when memory fills up, uh, we write it to a disk in a sorted way. Uh, and that's called an SS table, a sorted string table. And as time passes, uh, we get more of these SS tables being uh, deposited on, on disk. And uh, these SS tables uh, can contain uh, overwrites or uh, duplicate uh, keys. Uh, and these duplications are a performance problem because you need to read and merge all of those SS tables. So you need to, uh, uh, and also they occupy uh, duplicate space. So you need some process um, that merges those SS tables using a, a, a sequential uh, merge scan. And that process is called compaction. Uh, and while this compaction is happening, we, we keep depositing uh, more SS tables from uh, the foreground process, which is the, the writes. So this gives us a, a foreground job, which is the regular writes, and the background job, which uh, tries to uh, compact those uh, SS tables. And there are actually multiple levels of compaction because uh, uh, when you have this uh, uh, some SS table uh, written to disk, uh, well, you, you have to start uh, compacting SS table four and five and six as well, and you will get another uh, sort of uh, some SS table, and then you will need to compact, compact those. Uh, and the number of levels is uh, proportional to the logarithm of the disk to memory ratio. More or less, it depends on a few more factors, but that's sort of the, uh, uh, the guide. Um, so you usually have uh, maybe four or five levels uh, of or, or tiers. And this process causes a problem because it is a, a background job. And uh, those background jobs compete with the foreground jobs and you need to balance them. If the background jobs uh, consume too much, uh, too many resources, uh, this bandwidth and, and compute and uh, CPU compute power, then your foreground processes suffer and you, you get a reduction in, in throughput. Uh, but on the other hand, if uh, they don't get enough bandwidth, then the data on disk becomes uh, fragmented and your reads have to, and reads that miss the cache, have to read uh, many SS tables and then your read performance suffers. So you have to uh, close the loop and make sure that uh, uh, these background jobs get exactly the correct am amount of resources that, that correct amount of bandwidth in order to do their job. So what are our goals? Uh, so first we want to be efficient. Uh, we're given a number of uh, CPU cycles from, uh, uh, from the hardware. So uh, a number of cores and we want to make sure that the cycles go towards uh, uh, useful work and not uh, coordination or locking or things like that. So, uh, this is one reason to use C++ and not uh, a language like uh, Java. It, it, uh, um, it, it is a little bit faster, although that's not the main reason. Um, another goal is to have good utilization. So it's common to see on, on large machines that uh, uh, only uh, a small number of the cores are busy and the rest are waiting on locks. And the larger the machine, the harder it is to utilize all of it. Uh, it's also true for uh, IO resources. So uh, disks are now very fast. You can get millions of IO operations per second, uh, but it's rare to see uh, um, programs that can actually squeeze all of those uh, IOPS uh, from the disk. So we want to make sure that we are able to uh, use all of the CPU and with Scylla, it's common to, to see uh, the, the system running at 100%, uh, or if you count uh, each vCPU as 100%, at 7200%, uh, uh, and even more on larger machines. 
and that's uh, what would be uh, setting off alarms in other databases is actually indication uh, that the system is working as designed. And the last thing that we want to achieve uh, is um, to have control, to, to spend the cycles on uh, the, things that, uh, um, the things that we want to do uh, because we have uh, multiple uh, competing processes running on the system. Uh, I mentioned the compaction uh, a slide ago. So we want to make sure that we can direct the, the system to, to spend the number of cycles we want on compaction and the number of cycles we want on, on serving requests or doing other things uh, like uh, maintaining nodes, uh, uh, um, performing repairs. Um, so a database that does OLTP is characterized by having a, a large number of very small operations. So uh, many queries can be just uh, uh, about around a few hundred bytes. Uh, so we want to make uh, coordination cheap. We don't want to spend uh, a lot of uh, effort uh, taking and releasing locks uh, or uh, exercising um, uh, the cache coherency uh, of the CPU. Uh, we want to make everything uh, uh, very cheap. Uh, and there are also lots of uh, communications. Uh, and the communication can happen within the machine, so local procedure calls or inter-thread calls, um, or with the disk, uh, you read and write data from disk. Because we have a, a high uh, disk to RAM ratio, um, then we have to work with uh, a significant percentage of uh, cache misses. So we, we can't assume that everything is cached, so we have a, a large amount of disk traffic. And of course, being a distributed database, uh, there is a large amount of uh, communication with uh, uh, other machines. Uh, usually, if you have a replication factor of two, then writes require uh, three round trips and the reads require uh, two round trips uh, for a quorum. So the solution to having lots of, uh, um, lots of communication is to make everything uh, asynchronous. And uh, since you're uh, uh, in, in a class, then let's have a, a, a quick quiz. Does anyone recognize the object on, uh, on the slide? This is a SATA-based SSD. Uh, so uh, you're, you're very brave, but this was a trick question. This is, yeah. a, uh, this is of course, it would be a trick question. This is a network device. Uh, so uh, those little uh, gold-plated uh, uh, connectors are actually a network terminal, and uh, although we are used to uh, uh, treating a disk as a synchronous uh, device because uh, the, um, uh, the APIs are synchronous, so you issue a read and the system call blocks until the data is there, uh, what happens under the covers is that the kernel prepares a message to the disk the same way that it would send a message to another computer, send it over a, a kind of point-to-point -point link, uh, goes and does something else and uh, switches to a different the process. And then uh, the disk fetches the data, sends it over the link, and the kernel uh, wakes up the thread that was asleep. And, um, uh, and we go back to doing to what you like. But this is not an efficient way. You wouldn't dream of doing that with a remote node. So having like a thread per connection model, uh, everyone does networking asynchronously. And we also do um, disk I.O. asynchronously. So we treat the disk exactly as we would um, a remote uh, computer. And um, when we started, this was uh, relatively rare, at least among open source databases. Uh, but now with the uh, I.O. Uring uh, and with uh, the Go programming language, I think it's becoming uh, more common. Um, so let's have uh, another quiz. So what is this? This time it's not a trick question. Is it an Intel Xeon processor E5 V4 product family? Uh, yes, it is. It's uh, very good. You utilized the. Uh, <laughs> but what does HCC stand for? Yeah. Uh, I think high, it's core a high core count. Here. High core yeah. count. High core count. Um, if you if you were if you had said that it was a network device, then I would say no. It's a it's an Intel Xeon processor E5 or whatever. Uh, 
uh, but it actually does have a lot. A processor is really a, a network of uh, cores, and instead of uh, treating it in um, uh, in the way that most programs do, which is to ignore that fact and and just uh, um, have a shared shared data structures that are protected with locks. Uh, instead, we try to treat each core as a separate node and have explicit communication uh, between those nodes. So we send messages between the nodes, and this minimizes the amount of traffic on those internal networks and increases the scalability that we have uh, within the machine. So this is just as important as scalability uh, across the cluster because it allows us to have a smaller cluster which is easier to manage. So how do we do that? We have uh, one thread per core, and that means that uh, we must never block, because if uh, uh, a thread uh, uh, blocks, then that core will not have anything to run. Uh, so we must, whenever we do something that uh, uh, does IO, any network call or any, uh, um, or any uh, disk operation or any operation between cores, uh, we must be prepared to uh, continue doing something else. So we have a queue of things that we need to do, and uh, we never block on any operation. And everything is asynchronous. Um, networking, of course, everyone does asynchronous networking. Uh, file I.O. is more rare, and uh, we do that. So instead of having a read call, uh, we have uh, an operation to initiate a read from a file, an asynchronous read, and then we reap a completion uh, later on when it becomes ready. And meanwhile, we, we go and do other things. And also asynchronous multi-core. So if we need to access data that is owned by another core, uh, then we send a message to that other core, go and do something else. And uh, that other core picks up the message, performs the operation, uh, places the result on a point-to-point -point queue, and we will pick up the result and continue. Uh, so this is very different from general uh, SMP uh, programming, but it's actually very similar uh, to normal network programming, distributed programming, except that uh, you can't uh, have a failure. Uh, so you send always send messages between cores in the same way that you send messages between nodes. And the fact that uh, the database as a whole is distributed actually makes it easier because we use the same partitioning strategy that we use for nodes. We use the same strategy for uh, cores within the node. So let's look at the, how the, the programming stack looks. And um, today, there are actually intermediate stacks. So for uh, Go and uh, Erlang, you have like intermediate uh, uh, models where you have uh, uh, the runtime doing some of this work for you. Uh, but let's look at the traditional stack. So you have a number of threads, uh, usually a large number of threads, so that you can utilize all of the cores. And some of those threads are running, and some of those threads are sleeping. And the, uh, the kernel multiplexes those threads. But the problem is that if you have um, uh, very lightweight operations, which is uh, the premise of the whole thing, you have queries that uh, return a few hundred bytes, uh, then you end up having a large number of uh, context switches and a large effort to coordinate all of those threads. And you also end up with problems where either you have too few threads to run, uh, in which case you don't utilize the machine, or too many threads to run, uh, in which case uh, your latency increases because you have a lot of uh, uh, contention and the kernel might not pick the thread that uh, is most important for, for you to run. It might pick some other thread. So uh, our stack is with a thread per core, it has its own scheduler. So each, each thread gets its own internal scheduler. Uh, and uh, uh, it, run, it does a one to completion of small tasks. So those tasks typically take a few microseconds to run. And we can run around a million tasks per second per core. And those, um, uh, those cores communicate via point to point queue. So every pair of cores have a queue for um, uh, sending a message requesting that core to do something and a queue for results. Uh, and there is no sharing. So uh, uh, the, uh, the network that lies within the processor uh, has a lot less work to do. And so everything goes much faster. 
So let's uh, um, let's look a little bit about let's talk a little bit about concurrency. So I realize this is uh, computer science and, and not a math class. So, uh, uh, but I hope you'll forgive me. So there is the Little's law, uh, which says that the concurrency uh, is the a product of throughput and latency, and that makes sense. So if you uh, increase the throughput and keeping latency the same, uh, then you need to do more things in parallel in order to compensate for that increased throughput. And also, if you increase the latency while keeping the throughput the same, uh, again, you will need to uh, in increase the concurrency because each thing takes more time. Uh, now, let's do some math and look at uh, uh, look at uh, how the throughput uh, changes with the concurrency. Uh, so you can see uh, this is the same equation, just transformed a little bit. Um, so you can see that uh, in order to get higher throughput, if your latency is the same, you need higher concurrency. Um, and let's transform the equation again and look at how latency is a function of concurrency. And here we see that uh, uh, latency is concurrency divided by throughput. So if you want low latency, uh, you need low concurrency. So the dilemma here is that you need both high concurrency in order to achieve high throughput, and you also need low concurrency in order to achieve a low latency. Was there a question? No, it's, just, it's when people leave. Keep going. We're good. Okay. Um, another problem with concurrency is that there are some lower bounds. So uh, disks want a, a minimum uh, IO depth for, for in order to get the full uh, throughput. Uh, so think about the rate of uh, rotating disks. So they, there is a number of heads. And uh, let's say you have a rate of uh, five disks. So if the concurrency is less than five, you are going to have uh, one head that is idle. Uh, so you need that uh, at least five requests running in parallel and maybe even more in order to uh, avoid the, um, if, if you have some coll collisions. Uh, so you need some kind of minimum IO depth in for for um, for disks. Uh, the same for uh, remote nodes. So there is network latency which you want to hide. So you want to do some operations uh, concurrently, and also those remote nodes have their own uh, min minimum concurrency that they want. So you have to supply that. And uh, for compute, uh, you need uh, at least one operation running concurrently for each core that you have, or you will have some idle cores. So let's uh, summarize. Uh, we want high concurrency. We also want low concurrency. And we also want to be able to supply, in order to fully utilize the system, uh, uh, and, and some minimum amount of concurrency. Um, so how do we solve this, uh, this conflict? And the answer is, uh, is scheduling, but that's actually not the right slide. So I'll, I'll, I'll wait with that. So what are the sources of uh, concurrency? Um, so the first source is users. They are clicking on their uh, uh, web pages um, and generating traffic. Um, but we, you're not always in control. So if you have, a, if indeed it's a, like a web application or um, then, uh, the, the source of concurrency is something that is a given. It's not something that uh, uh, we can change. Um, we can add nodes as the operators of the database, uh, and this reduces the, the per node concurrency. So you, you divide the same overall concurrency on a larger number of nodes, but this is something that uh, you might want to avoid. And we also have the case that we have um, multiple workloads. So you have, say, uh, um, uh, um, web, web users that are clicking their way through an application. And also you have an analytics workload that is running concurrently and scanning the database. So you, you have multiple kinds of requests that are running uh, in parallel throughout the system. And there are also internal processes that generate the concurrency. So I mentioned the uh, compaction before. So uh, uh, compaction, if you have a compaction process running, uh, it uh, generates reads and writes. And if you do uh, uh, read aheads, uh, 
you can also have um, a single compaction process uh, generating multiple requests concurrently. So the trick here is to have the internal processes generate a lot of concurrency in order to be able to utilize the system, but also uh, schedule those requests. So choose which requests get to run when in order to uh, limit the impact of concurrency on latency. And this is how we do it. So let's say that we decided that uh, our storage can handle uh, eight uh, requests concurrently. And later I'll, I'll show how we figure that out. Um, but you can imagine that we have a RAID array that has eight disks, each of which has uh, one, uh, one movable head. Um, so, and we have uh, um, a bunch of inputs. We have uh, uh, um, users that are reading from the database with a concurrency of say 30 and writing with a concurrency of 12. And we have an internal sources of uh, concurrency, uh, compaction and streaming. Streaming refers to the process of uh, starting uh, another node. Uh, so you need to move data from the existing nodes to the new nodes. So it also generates a request. And the idea is to push only to the storage only as many requests as uh, it can handle. Uh, without uh, uh, starting to back up and, and having congestion. And this allows the scheduler to pick the right request to, uh, to send to the uh, storage. So as soon as uh, the storage completes one request, uh, we pick another uh, request that is waiting on one of the queues and send it off. And this allows us uh, to have uh, uh, on the one hand, have low latency because the storage is only handling the number of requests that it can without trouble. And on the other hand, uh, we avoid having uh, idle time in the storage because as soon as uh, we have a slot free, we feed it a request from one of the internal processes. How sophisticated is like, are, is like the schedule in terms of like, the, the met, what med metadata are you exposing about the, the things in the queue? Like, you know, I'm reading this file and this offset, and I'm and I, I have this priority. Do you go any deeper than that, or or is it just like a so is it pretty every, every request is uh, tagged by uh, uh, the originating uh, the, like the internal process that originated it. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, every we know about every request, whether it's a user read or a user write, uh, or whether it's a part of a compaction process. And when we have multiple workloads, we know which workload is doing that. So we know this came from Spark or this came from uh, the web application. And we know that uh, um, the Spark should get lower priority than, uh, than the web application. And uh, those queues have uh, an, an amount of shares that are assigned to them. And by the way, I'm talking about IO, but the, the same thing uh, uh, holds for a CPU. So uh, every task that we run, and uh, recall that a task can be something that runs a, uh, in, in a microsecond, uh, is uh, tagged with uh, the originating process. Uh, so, um, uh, so and, uh, and we uh, account for all of those tasks. So we know exactly for each queue, we know exactly how much, uh, we know its execution history, and we know how much uh, shares we assign to that queue, and we can then uh, select the next task so that uh, um, the restrictions or the constraints on, on the shares are satisfied. Um, I hope that uh, answers the question. Yes. Um, OK. Um, so why don't we use the Linux IO scheduler? Uh, Linux has a very capable set of IO schedulers, but they have uh, limitations. So the first is that you can only communicate the priority by, uh, by the originating thread. So you can assign a priority to uh, different threads. Uh, but in our case, we have uh, one thread doing, uh, doing everything. So we have the same thread multiplexing uh, compaction and user reads and writes and the spark reads and, and everything else. So uh, everything gets mixed. Uh, it will also do a reordering and, and merging. Uh, so it likes to send the requests in, in the orders that it thinks is optimal for getting throughput, but 
that's not good if it takes your the request that is latency sensitive and it puts it in the back because it thinks that's uh, that's more optimal. So what we do is we disable merging and and reordering, um, and this gives us uh, the control that we need in order to uh, have a good latency response. Um, so previously I said that uh, each disk has uh, its kind of favorite concurrency. Uh, it's actually a little bit more complicated. Oh, and by the way, you asked about what we track. We also track um, the uh, the size of the request and whether it's in the direction, if it's a read or a write, because uh, this have a different uh, response to reads and writes. Um, so this graph shows the um, the response of a disk to concurrency. So on the x-axis, we have increasing concurrency. Um, and by the way, you shouldn't take the high concurrency as good. Uh, better, uh, actually, a better disk would be one that achieves a high throughput with the low concurrency. Um, so, uh, and in blue, we have uh, the throughput. So you can see that um, uh, as the concurrency increases, uh, the throughput rises more or less linearly, and then it begins to plateau, and then the throughput uh, stops uh, increasing. And what happens in the disk is it, it starts to queue the request instead of serving them uh, in parallel. Um, in red, you have um, uh, the latency, and uh, if you squint, uh, then you, you will see that uh, uh, the response is opposite. So on, um, uh, when the concurrency is low, uh, the latency should be uh, more or less constant because uh, when you feed a request, a new request, then it uh, starts executing in parallel. But as soon as you saturate the disk at around uh, 100 uh, concurrent requests, the latency starts to increase. It's hard to see it because of the error bars and because it's a noisy graph. Uh, but at least the theory says that uh, uh, concurrency should be more or less constant at the beginning of the graph and more or less linear uh, after we enter the, the congestion area. So what we do is we run a benchmark uh, when we install the system and we figure out how this, uh, what this graph looks like. And that informs the scheduler. The scheduler figures out where this uh, 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 sweet spot is and it uh, only lets the disk process uh, the amount of requests, and it depends on, on the size and the type of request as well, um, that uh, uh, it, can, it requires for, um, for good throughput, and everything else it will hold uh, in user space. And um, the fact that we keep those requests in user space allows us to select the next request that will run. So this gives us the, the control and allows us to respond rapidly to um, uh, user reads, which want low latency, and uh, delay the, uh, the batch operations, uh, like uh, scans for Spark, or compactions, or streaming, or any of the other things that the database needs to do to maintain itself. Um, OK, uh, I talked about uh, uh, self-tuning. Um, and uh, this kind of uh, uh, fell out of all of the uh, schedulers that we have. So we have a huge amount of control about what we do. And this is a, a natural way to utilize this is to uh, use feedback in order to change the controls. So the way it works is that uh, we have a bunch of queues. So internal processes that feed queues uh, of operations. and the scheduler uh, decides which um, uh, which queue to uh, consume. So um, uh, it can uh, say we have a request coming on the query queue. So the scheduler will pick uh, a, a request from uh, the query queue and uh, let the disk process it. And then it will might pick uh, a query from uh, a request from the compaction queue and so forth. And it will select from those queues on the basis of the amount of shares that we assign to them. But here comes the trick. So uh, we have a feedback back loop. How will we decide how many shares to assign to compaction? Um, so we look at the amount of uh, work that is remaining for us to do in, in compaction. We have a backlog monitor. And it 
uh, keeps track of uh, all of the work that it still have to do. And it adjusts the priority in order to try to keep that uh, backlog stable. Uh, and uh, what this means is that uh, uh, if your backlog starts to increase, which means that you're uh, not do doing enough compaction, the number of shares that are assigned for compaction will increase and it will consume more resources uh, from the system uh, in order to, uh, to, to become stable. And on the other hand, if the um, backlog, the backlog, compaction backlog becomes lower, then the amount of shares that the compaction needs will lower in turn, and we will uh, free those resources for other parts of the system. Uh, we have the same thing for other components. I'll skip over that because it's more of the same. So this is an example of um, this in action. Um, so uh, in green, we have a uh, uh, request serve. And uh, we started a, a workload, a write workload. And it starts at a high rate. And immediately, it starts slowing down. This is because uh, uh, when you start the workload, it uh, only talks to memory. But after a while, it starts have to, it has to flush to disk. So it becomes uh, um, um, more and more intensive. Uh, and uh, in, um, in yellow, you have the compaction shares. And you see that uh, in the beginning, no share, it's actually the CPU time. So in the beginning, there is very little backlog because there is no data on disk. So the scheduler assigns very little CPU time for compaction. But after a while, uh, it stabilizes on, on uh, some level, um, and it keeps that uh, stable. But in the middle, we change the workload. And now we're using a different size request, which require different amount of uh, processing. And what happens is that the, um, the schedule, the backlog monitor notices that the backlog increases and it starts assigning uh, more CPU for. Uh, yeah, I think that we, we uh, uh, we're out of time. If you, if you want to continue, then I'm happy. Uh, I don't know if people have time. Uh, and if not, we can just move to questions, uh, although that was uh, the really interesting bits. Yeah, so, um, I mean, yeah, it is, it is 12.30, so it's super late for you, so I, I don't want to, like, keep you up all night. Um, so what is, if you, if, you email me, if you email me my slides, I'll be able to post them on, 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 on the website. Um, yeah. But I guess, I think, I, think, I think some people have some basic questions or some, some questions we want to go through first. Okay, so go ahead with questions, and I'll try to email the slides in, uh, in the background. Yes. Um. Hi. Go for yeah, it. I, I have a question. I, I don't know if there's an ordering or... No, it's chaos. Go for it. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I'm Nick. I'm calling in from uh, the Netherlands. So here it's also... Uh, uh, it's actually uh, 11.30 here in the evening. Uh, but thank you, uh, Avi, for uh, the talk. Um, I have a, a question. Uh, actually, not uh, what you talked about, but I've been following uh, C-Star um, and... Well, it's uh, clear that you also have your own uh, TCP IP stack on top of uh, DPDK. And uh, I, I read some, uh, some papers that compare um, uh, kernel bypass techniques and, and, and those papers all also mentioned C-Star. And they, met, they mentioned then as a drawback, like, yeah, this is a maintenance burden to, to maintain such a... Uh, 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 from scratch or written from scratch TP, uh, TCP IP stack, uh, if you compare it to just using, say, the, the Linux uh, stack or the, or the host stack. And my question is, is that actually true? Is it a, a real burden? Like, is TCP IP still changing? And is it a, a lot of work to keep up with that? Or is it actually you write it once and once in a while you still have to maintain it, but, but it's, uh, it, it's okay? Okay, so I suppose that uh, if we invested effort in maintaining it, then it would be a maintenance burden because even even though TCP doesn't change, uh, you still have to fix bugs. But the truth is that we don't really use uh, the native stack. Uh, in the end, it turns out to be a, a deployment problem. You have to detach the, the network card from Linux and assign it to uh, to to the database. Uh, and that is work that uh, uh, 
it is not easy to do. Maybe today in cloud environments, it's easier because uh, everything is a lot more homogeneous. You have just a few types of, uh, of systems. Uh, but for like enterprise deployments, in the end, it turned out to be too difficult to use. And we really did not invest much in it. It's a pity because I really like it. And uh, you, you can get the better performance and better distribution of uh, compute across uh, uh, the cores. Um, so uh, I'm sad that we're not using it uh, more extensively, but the truth is that uh, uh, it's not a burden because we're not really uh, using it as much as we should. I see, yeah. I had a question. So um, I'm Dipayan, I'm an undergrad studying at senior. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, how you use C++ 20 code routines because uh, we tried to implement that in our system, but the problem we came across was that you can't suspend from a nested stack frame, right? So um, how do you guys go about making the execution model support stackless code routines? Uh, what, what, what I missed uh, what you can do. Uh, uh, you can't suspend from a nested stack frame, so you can only like suspend from the top level of the function. Um, so uh, we uh, no for stackless coroutines you can you can suspend from any level so long as uh, you return futures. So uh, our basic uh, primitive is a future, and all of our coroutines uh, return a future. So uh, every time you call a function that uh, returns a future, that is a suspension point, uh, and. Uh, um, not sure exactly what, where you saw the problem because for us it just uh, fits naturally. The, the coroutine model works uh, very naturally with uh, futures and promises. So a coroutine is just a, a function that returns um, uh, a future, and every time you have a call await, uh, it's just uh, every time you have you call another coroutine, it's you usually call it with call await, uh, which pre uh, can be a suspension point if that function returns a future that is not ready. Okay. I'm not sure that I understood the problem, so maybe my answer wasn't very good. So, I, I, so the problem we saw was that you can only like return back to the thing that called it. Like you can't suspend from one function and go to like a completely like different coroutine, right? Um, so we have like multiple threads executing different things. We execute one and then we want to switch over to something that's completely unrelated. Um, were you able to achieve that with stuff? Yes, it's, yes, and it's uh, completely natural. So it's, uh, okay. we, we, um, the, the we adapted, we, ad we had our system that uh, used the continuations. So future, uh, future dot then, uh, and we adapted it to use coroutines with very minimal changes. So it's the same scheduler and it's the same underlying model. Um, uh, for us, it worked very naturally, maybe because the system already was based on continuations. Uh, and uh, every time you call a coroutine, uh, you, you already have a suspension point. So it's not like you're nested multiple levels in, in the stack. I would say to Pine, so LeaDB is open source, so it might make sense to go look at their code and understand yeah, what they're okay. doing. Cool. Okay. Yeah, and mm -hmm. feel free to ask questions on uh, the C-Star mailing list, how it works. Um, we'll be happy to answer. Awesome, thank you. My name is Jordi, and I also have a question. So this is more regarding stuff you might have done in the past. I know that you use IO Euring now for a lot of IO-related asynchronous stuff, but at any point, did you experiment with using ePoll or more synchronous APIs? And if so, did you notice any impact on latency? Um, so uh, in the beginning, uh, uh, we used the ePoll and the um, for networking and uh, Linux AIO for uh, uh, block IO. Uh, and uh, later we uh, changed the Linux AIO to also support uh, networking. And this is what we do in preference. We don't yet support IO Euring, although it's like a, uh, an excellent match for the system. Uh, we prototyped it, but uh, in the end, it didn't show uh, any significant improvement. Uh, in a way, um, um, the Linux area support for ePOL, which we implemented, is uh, uh, really the forerunner of uh, IOU ring. Uh, and it, it's, um, 
um, for EPAL, the, the problem with EPAL is not that uh, the interface is bad, it's just that it requires a lot of uh, system calls to maintain and it's not integrated. So you have different uh, APIs to do different things. And with IOU ring and, or, or with Linux IO, you have uh, one ring through which you send the request to listen on file descriptors or start the network request and one ring on which you get the responses. So um, you, you save on a large number of system calls and it's all amortized. So with one system call, you bunch up a, a number of file descriptors and a number of um, uh, disk IOs. And did you see reducing the system calls impacting latency or was that just like a throughput. nice side effect? But No, the system calls affect the throughput. They don't affect latency. They're all non-blocking. Um, of course, uh, if you uh, exhaust uh, the throughput capabilities of the system, then you end up with the latency impact. But the direct impact is the throughput. Okay, thank you. So as, as long as the system is not overloaded, you get very similar latency. Uh, as soon as it gets overloaded, then of course queues build up and you get the uh, high latency. But the, the model of uh, talking to the kernel doesn't directly impact latency. Thank you so much. So my, my name is Ling. Uh, I'm a PhD student here. Uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. So my question is that I'm wondering how you uh, decide the boundaries of those small tasks that you mentioned about. Is it just flows naturally or there's some like certain principles or guidelines you are following? And also, how do you ensure that the task is as small as you expected? Because I, I heard you, you mentioned it could be just microseconds or some milliseconds, right? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question and also a, a difficult one. And we're struggling with it uh, every day. Uh, so some tasks really are very simple. You launch an I/O operation or you launch uh, a cross, uh, so those are the coordination tasks. But the compute tasks are the ones that are difficult uh, because they can take very long. So for that, we have a, a kind of a user space uh, tick and uh, we, we use that by having uh, another Linux AR rings that is uh, running on a timer. So when, whenever the, we have a completion for the timer, whenever the timer fires, the kernel queues the completion. And the, uh, when it queues the completion, it modifies the indexes in the ring. So, and we, we, use, we compare the indexes to the ring to, notice, to note, that, note that we need to do preemption. And all of our loops, uh, whenever we have a loop, we also check for preemption. And we, um, it's not every loop. So if we loop on uh, a, small uh, a small number of iterations, then we don't really care. But when you have a loop that is unbounded or can have a large number of iterations, then we check for preemption and we break the loop. And uh, you will see that in a large, um, large number of places in our code. Of course, we don't directly check for, for preemption. We have primitives that do it for us, uh, but uh, this is a, a source of latency whenever you have a computation um, that, isn't, that doesn't have this preemption check. Uh, so indeed, it's a, it's a serious problem and we continuously uh, 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 find ways, find places where we have this uh, uh, unbounded loops and, and fix them. We have a latency detector uh, that uh, uh, sets a timer and uh, uh, when it expires, it sends a signal and uh, with, a sig with a signal, we get a backtrace of the loop that is consuming this CPU time without the latency check. And uh, our QA team uh, sends us lots of nice bug reports with those backtraces and we figure out the source and then usually then it's an easy task to uh, add, add the preemption check. Usually it's uh, some data structure that uh, we thought would, would not grow too large, but actually does. And edge cases like if um, someone runs a, a database with thousands of tables, whereas the usual number is a few dozen tables. Uh, so in those edge cases, we, we get uh, uh, high latency, and because this is a cooperative system, uh, whenever you get that, everyone feels it. So uh, uh, the, the impact is pretty strong. So this is uh, uh, one of the things to, you have to worry about with this kind of cooperative architecture. So on one hand, you win in terms of uh, performance because the coordination is cheap, but on the other hand, everyone has to be really cooperative and friendly or you get uh, latency spikes.
Yeah, thanks for the answer. Just a quick follow up. Will you want to make sure? Will you say you do a preemption and then break up the loop? Do you just to package up the remaining task of the loop and then requeue that into the into your whatever? Exactly. And, okay. Exactly. Okay. So we repackage it. So usually it means an allocation in order to save the state and uh, package it in a task structure, which gets queued in in the task queue. So right. this sounds like a huge amount of manual work, but actually it's automatic. Uh, if you if you're working with coroutines, then or it's even simpler. And we also have uh, user level threads, in which case the, the data is just on the stack. So all of the automatic variables just stay on the stack, and uh, the the thread gets resumed. And we, we can have lots of those threads running. Of course, we prefer not to have threads because they're expensive in terms of their memory footprint. But we do use them in in places where it's uh, simpler and where we don't have a large amount of concurrency. Okay, that was awesome. Uh, any last question for anybody else? Yeah. Maybe, maybe, sorry, please. Yeah. I already went, so if it's allowed. Uh, go for it. Nick, go for it. You're further away. Um, yeah, uh, so for I have a question about the internode uh, communication, for which in C star you have this RPC class and you, you do TCP IP uh, uh, protocol, the TCP protocol. Uh, did you ever consider uh, like uh, using UDP with your own uh, reliability uh, on, on top? Uh, or do you never suffer from, say, the possible drawbacks of TCP in terms of latency, especially if you have some packet loss? Do you ever... Oh, so I consider it uh, almost once a week. Uh, so I have like this routine where I think, okay, this, is, this sucks. It really should be using UDP. And then I start thinking about all the mechanisms that we have to implement in order to have reliability and to package many small messages into one packet and also to fragment a large me message into many, uh, many smaller packets because we have all, all kinds of messages uh, and to do the reliability. And uh, in the end, uh, it's just uh, too much work for too little gain. So TCP does have problems, but it, it uh, uh, it, it isn't worth all of the trouble. Of course, the next week I forget all of that and I start thinking about it again, but it's always the same, uh, the same result. I'll, I'll alert you if I ever come up with a different, uh, but it is very tempting. So, uh, and, and I did implement in the past uh, um, uh, RPC based on, on UDP and they do have advantages, uh, but right now uh, it's not worth it for us. Maybe we should move to RDNA because it's now becoming more um, available on at least on, on well in, in one of the advantage of the clouds is that it, they make uh, the hardware more homogeneous and there is a, a sort of minimal baseline that you can expect. Uh, so maybe we will jump from UDP to RDMA. Okay, awesome. Uh, Len, do you have a quick question? Or? Yeah, very quick one. Uh, sorry, uh, very quick one. So we mentioned that you are monitoring the CPU resource and performance as well. I'm wondering what, how do you measure the CPU time or resource, whatever? Like basically, are you using the perf library or are you directly read off the performance counters from the CPU? Like uh, how did you do that? Uh, no, so if you, if you look at something like uh, the RDTSC instruction, you see it takes about uh, 20 odd cycles. And, sure. and for me, that's too much. Uh, um, so what we do is instead of measuring every task, every individual task, which would have way too much overhead, uh, we batch all of the tasks from the same queue. And uh, uh, we have a, a preemption timer every half millisecond. And this way, we, we do the accounting at the granularity of a half a millisecond. So we, we let the queue run. And then when, when it either completes or it preempts, we measure it with, uh, uh, with nanosecond granularity, uh, but we don't measure each individual task. So we, um, the, um, the overall uh, sharing is, uh, is fair between the queues or fair according to the number of shares, but not every individual task. So uh, uh, it's actually the same way that uh, uh, you do normal thread scheduling. You, you don't, uh, uh, schedule every millisecond. You schedule every some kind of time slice. For us, the time slice is uh, half a millisecond, and we just batch all of the tasks that uh, share the same, that have the same uh, uh, key, the same tag. Uh, 
And it's simpler, but we just keep all of those tasks in, in, uh, in separate queues. So we process oh, a queue. I see. Okay. okay. That's super interesting. All right. I realize it was 1 a.m. I had to ask you this question because I'm asking everyone this. Uh, I, how stupid are, you, are your users? Like, how, how often are you surprised at them trying to use Celia DB in a way that, like, you know, you never intended and shouldn't be used? Or do you find that the users are coming to you having also uh, maybe already been burned by your Cassandra and are looking for something better, and therefore they're a bit more sophisticated? Uh, so first, our users are very smart for picking us. So that's already, uh, <laughs> they, yes. after that, they really can do no wrong. Uh, but, uh, well, you're right that uh, many of our users uh, do come from existing large deployments where they suffer uh, latency problems. And not just Cassandra, also MongoDB. So they, they already, um, they've already been burned. They know where the problems are. Uh, it takes some adjustments. So even though we're completely compatible with Cassandra, there are still some things that are different, uh, like you need more connections. And uh, because you're talking to more shards, we also have, uh, um, uh, we can also connect directly to the shards. So we have uh, uh, a specialized driver that knows to send the query directly to the shards, that, that to the CPU cores that will process it. And it saves an internal hop and also improves the, the load balancing. We, we see mistakes, uh, so we, we see people not using prepared statements uh, or using um, data models that uh, don't have enough partitions, so they end up overloading a node and overloading a shard. And actually, our architecture is uh, more vulnerable to this kind of mistakes because we, uh, although we will usually have many fewer nodes, we will have many fewer, uh, a, a much larger number of cores doing processing, and each core owns a subset of the data. So you have to be even more careful about the data distribution. Um, yeah, uh, so people do mistakes. Uh, we, we also have some complete newcomers and they really have uh, 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 problems with uh, basic data modeling, which you would expect. It's a, a specialized data model. In order to go, um, be able to provide this kind of throughput, you, you need to make some trade-offs. And without understanding those trade-offs, it's hard to design the application. So people do make mistakes, uh, and it's common. We have a, a university course that is designed to uh, ease them into it. But of course, uh, uh, people do sometimes keep on doing mistakes, and we try to help them. OK, awesome. I I immensely appreciate you staying up uh, so late with us, even given through all the technical difficulties. I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. Uh, again, in my opinion, this is this is exactly like mean, this. This is extremely interesting, and you're touching on a lot of things that, as you saw, a lot of my students had had questions for this. So I appreciate you spending your time and letting us pick your brain on this.